All right, well, welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. We're here to discuss the Iroquois Park Scenic Loop that we know has been closed for over a year now. Um, due to COVID-19 restrictions, we, we saw a ton of people using the park, right? And it was fantastic, but we needed to make social distancing space. So we closed off our vehicular traffic and left open for our pedestrians and bikers. And, and it's been great. It's been a wonderful experience for those users. But we also noticed it's provided some challenges for us. For those who do enjoy their, their vehicles and taking a trip through the park and, and see all the beautiful trees and foliage and all the great things that, that make the loop and the park fantastic. Um, so really what we're here to do tonight is talk about how do we move forward from here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the agenda as well, um, but it's really how do we move forward. So tonight really is going to offer two tools in the toolbox, right? We're going to talk about the survey results as well as some mapping potentials. And then we're also going to get the feedback tonight, and that's going to help us as we move forward in making these decisions. Um, we know many residents have reached out to council members directly, to the Olmstead Parks Conservancy, as well as our department, and we love their passion and that they care about this park so much. Um, but again, no final decision is made, made this evening. This is really a, a chance to gather information uh, and share information with each other. Um, a little about our team that'll be here tonight. Again, I'm Dana Kassler, Director for Louisville Parks and Recreation. Also, we have Jeff O'Brien, Co-Chief of Louisville Forward when he's available. Uh, the President and CEO of Olmstead Parks Conservancy, Layla George. Assistant Parks Director, Margaret Brasco, along with Dirk Gowan and Jeff Brown from Public Works. And we're joined by Council Members, uh, Councilman Triplett, Councilman George, Councilwoman Stewart. And I, if I'm missing anybody, I apologize. I don't see them on my screen. Uh, with that then, and again, the agenda, um, we will go over the survey or the um, mapping first, uh, and Layla will take that over. Then we'll have the survey results. We'll then turn to the council members for any comments they would like to make, and then open it for the public questions that'll that'll be in the Facebook Live. So with that, I will turn it over to Miss Layla. Thank you, Dana. Um, happy to be here with all of you this evening. As Dana mentioned, we've gotten a lot of feedback. Um, there hasn't been any real consensus that's come out of this. So tonight we just wanna look at um, kind of pre-pandemic, what the loop looked like and current conditions now. So we can go forward in the slide deck. It's just a little bit, yes, here we go. So pre-pandemic, this is what the loop looked like. You can see that it wasn't completely open. Um, we had the southern section in red that was already closed from Sanders Gate Road to the amphitheater parking lot. That has been closed as well as Melody Lane. Um, that access point was closed uh, before the pandemic. The road to the scenic overlook um, was also closed. I know that a lot of people have asked about that up old road there. That's due to a completely different situation. As many of you know, there's been movement of the road and um, one of the engineers at the parks department is meeting with the team, I think probably quarterly or every six months to kind of see how much it's moving. And then once they get information back, they can come up with a cost estimate on fixing that. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, you can see what it has looked like since April. So for the past year, it has really been completely closed uh, with the exception of kind of the entrance to Southern Parkway, getting to that parking lot at the um, uphill road area. And then also you can get into the parking lot by the playground and amphitheater, Sunny Hill Pavilion um, and back by the equestrian center. So that's what's open now. Um, I can tell you that from the conservancy standpoint, what we've heard is we've heard a lot of people who really have enjoyed walking the loop without vehicular traffic. Um, I think it's been quieter. I think trash has been less of an issue. Um, but we've also heard from a lot of residents, probably from the kind of Southwest area of Iroquois Park. So Councilwoman Stewart's district is my guess, um, who, you know, I talked to one gentleman the other day who couldn't get to the golf course very easily. He had to go all the way around the park because he used to kind of come in at Sanders Gate and cut up to the golf course. So it's not just cut through traffic. It's not just um, 
kind of people doing pleasure drives around that section of the loop that's been open, but also people just taking longer and an inconvenience to get to amenities that are open. Um, so that's the way it is now. I think the survey looked at a couple different options. Um, I know that that Iroquois Road entrance, that Iroquois Parkway entrance, uh, the little green stick there on the uh, kind of left side of the map is where a lot of people enter when they want some relief from traffic, maybe on Manslick Road, um, or even just going to work or going somewhere from kind of the west side to the east side. I think a lot of people kind of go through that way and out Southern Parkway. Um, that's some of the feedback I've heard. Um, I don't know if anybody is making questions in the um, Facebook Live event or if there's any um, anything that I can answer about the map specifically, I'm happy to do so. Okay, thank you, Layla. Um, <clears throat> and obviously, we can take all these all these questions and, and compile them at the end. Um, and now, Margaret, we will turn to you to go over to the survey. Great, thanks a lot, Dana. I really appreciate it. Um, just again, want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, hopefully, we'll get some great feedback. And as everybody mentioned, over the last year um, that the loop has had some restrictions to vehicles, we've heard from a lot of people. We've heard from people who are calling saying, we love it this way, we want it to stay close to vehicles. We've heard people calling and saying, oh my gosh, when is it gonna reopen? Um, and just about everything in between. So just again, as a parks department, as members of council, we thought the best way to really make sure we're hearing from everybody is to get as much feedback as we can. That's why we're having this uh, Facebook Live event today to hear people's thoughts. Um, that's why Councilwoman George and so many others have been in the park over the last week and will continue to do so just talking to users to really get your feedback. So I really want to stress that the survey and the results of the survey is just one way that we're receiving feedback one way but we're taking all the feedback that we're getting and really putting it into consideration as we look for what the the loop is going to look like uh, potentially down the line so just think that's really important for everybody to know so when we talk about this particular component of feedback that we've got we had a, about 3,000 people who responded to the survey online uh, we know that some people don't like computers or online things they don't like facebook so again that's why we're just trying to get as much feedback as we can from a variety of different ways so we thank councilwoman george for also getting some paper surveys to us as well so again just under three thousand people um, responded to the survey uh, one of the questions that we had is uh, since the loop is closed i feel safer utilizing it uh, the response to that we found a 63.47 percent said yes they feel safer um, and just over 36% said um, no, that they felt safe both ways. Another question we asked, in what way, if any, has your park accessibility been restricted during the loop closure? Um, the majority of people who responded to that said that the accessibility um, hasn't been restricted. 20% uh, said that there have been some commuter issues, as, uh, as Layla discussed. Um, about 9% said they have to walk to the archery site and some other amenities and uh, also mentioned um, some people said it takes a little bit longer uh, to get to the golf course, depending upon where you're coming from going to the golf course. Uh, another question under what conditions would you support reopening the loop? Um, this was, uh, as, as Dana said, across the board. Uh, we had a lot of different responses to this particular question. Um, so um, the, the majority of people said no condition would make me support reopening it. That was uh, just about 35%. Um, the, the second one was they would uh, support reopening it if um, implementation of other traffic calming measures were put into place. Uh, another host of people, around 30%, said that they want it open regardless of the conditions. Um, and then just over 20% said um, that they would support reopening the loop if the loop was closed to vehicles on certain days. Um, and then uh, just over 8% um, had some other thoughts. Uh, another question, if the loop reopens to vehicle traffic, would you be in favor of occasional temporary road closures for recreational purpose purposes? And bam, this is the biggest majority um, that we had for any of the questions. Um, almost 85% of people, again, that took this survey 
um, said that they uh, would be in favor of occasional temporary road closures. Um, so we just wanted to share those. All of the results of the survey will be posted online after this meeting. It's real easy to remember our website, bestparksever.com, bestparksever.com. Um, so definitely um, look at that if you have any questions or if you just want to take a little bit closer of a look. Um, and also, again, we cannot mention enough that no decisions are being made today. We are still gathering information. And so if you mention this to your coworkers or neighbors or friends, and they say they haven't heard about it and they want to provide feedback, the window of opportunity is wide open. Again, jump on our website, send us an email at parks at louisvilleky.gov, or feel free to have them post some comments um, in the same stream um, that we're going live from tonight. So on that note, Dana, we'll send it uh, back to you to get some feedback from the council members. All right, thank you so much, Margaret. Um, so I will first go to Councilman Triplett for your comments and thoughts. Thank you, Dana, and thank you everyone for the efforts uh, that we've put into this, uh, uh, putting a strategy and a, and a game plan in place prior to opening up. I think it's uh, important and I applaud everyone's efforts. And I also accept the fact that we're probably, we're, go we're gonna get it right, but uh, there's gonna be some disappointment by some, uh, however we do this. Um, um, I, I personally have, have you know, made no secret about how I personally feel about it. I think that road was developed many, many, many years ago and maintained for all this time for a purpose. Uh, and it wasn't just to walk or ride bikes on. Iroquois Park is a, is, a, is a destination park and serves many, many purposes, and not just for the people that live nearby. Uh, I think that uh, the Olmstead plan and the original design for that park was, was for a purpose of those roads, all the roads, not just Rundhill Road around the bottom of the loop, but the road to the top and so forth. So uh, I, I've, been, I've been open about my personal feeling about it. Uh, since over the last couple of weeks, uh, most of the calls and the emails that I've gotten in my office are clearly in favor of opening it up. The, the, the people that I have spoke to personally that want to see it close, of course, were the people that I, I interacted with while I was walking safe and sound on the road over the last couple of weeks on nice days. Uh, I, I stopped two ladies that live in the uh, the neighborhood there where Melody Lane is. I saw them come up through the neighborhood and uh, to enjoy a walk. So I, I stopped and introduced myself. And here they are, live next door to each other and they're best friends and they were divided. They 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 weren't uh, agreeing on uh, on the uh, the issue. One wanted it open, one wanted it closed. Um, so I'll let the others speak, but just just clearly the 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 voices and the reaction that I'm getting in my office clearly want the park open, and um, and and I would say that's probably and and I haven't been flooded with calls. I, I've gotten a, a great amount of calls just over the last several days as this issue uh, is brought to the front. I know, for example, uh, WHAS has that rant line, uh, Doug Profit. Uh, one of the rants was uh, the, the Cherokee and the air coin loop issue. And I know they've gotten calls um, so on that. But, uh, but the, most of the calls and emails that I've gotten have been here just recently, and, uh, and they are in favor of uh, opening the loop. All right, thank you, Councilman. Uh, I'll now turn to Councilman George. Thank you, Director. Um, I just want to say that I love the passion that this has inspired in our communities around Iroquois Park, and I'm grateful for all of our partners uh, who have been dedicated to working on improvements. It was really refreshing when Councilman Blackwell and I were in the park. We heard from several uh, park goers who talked about the hardworking Metro Park staff who take care of the park every day. Um, also, just want to thank all all the neighbors who took the time to complete the survey, um, as well as you know make calls to the council office, contact Olmstead. I think that's really important as we move forward in this. One thing we all know is that COVID has been incredibly difficult 
on our community. And yet it has also offered us an opportunity to reexamine, you know, um, ways of, of best park utilization and ways that we're serving uh, the overall needs of the community. And so I think it's clear from the survey results, as well as the folks that we've spoken with in the park, that it really is all about positionality. You know, it's everyone has a different opinion based on how they utilize the park, what their relationship is to it. Um, and so, you know, certainly lots of voices, um, but again, where they come from and, and how they use the park seems to be guiding uh, positions around what folks want to see happen. Um, I'm of the mindset that there's a clear need for balance as it relates to park safety and accessibility, as well as, you know, considering how the park was originally designed um, and what is in the best interest of, of the greatest number. So um, I'm looking forward to learning from, from what others uh, want to see happen and taking all those factors into consideration with problem solving. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. Um, we will now to go to Councilman Stewart. Thank you. Thanks for having me on tonight. Um, I just want to first start uh, by saying that I think that there's always a great compromise when, when we approach um, issues like this. Um, uh, but I do uh, represent District 25, and um, I want to say, you know, up front that the vast majority um, almost all of our calls have have been in favor of reopening up um, the, the loop as it was pre COVID. Um, I also see this as an issue um, where um, it's easy to, to overlook the, the people that um, that do not walk or do not bike or do not run. Um, and those would be uh, those um, constituents, those people that live um, and and work in the area that might have health issues or might be disabled. And so um, those people enjoy the park um, for the aesthetic you know, purposes um, by using their, their cars. So I like uh, Councilman Triplett, um, you know, tend to um, favor reopening, like I said, the park uh, as it was pre COVID so that those um, individuals are not um, left out. Um, I think it's important that we serve all of our uh, citizens in the city. And I think that um, it is used for a, a cut through sometimes, but um, really the vast majority of the people uh, that we that we've heard from, um, you know, like to drive the park just to enjoy it. And those people are not able to, um, like I said, run, uh, walk or, or bike. Um, so, um, I represent that district and that's what I'm hearing back from from the folks in um, in district 25. Um, I think there's been some talk about possibly making it a one way. Um, you know, in and out uh, and, and maybe possibly adding some speed humps and I, I wouldn't be opposed to that. I think safety should be an issue um, and and we should take, you know, make that a priority. So um, with that, I'm open, like I said, to um, Compromise, um, whatever it takes um, to serve the people of the city. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilwoman. And I see that the Councilman Fowler and Councilman Blackwell have joined us as well. Uh, so, Councilman Blackwell, if you've got any comments, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. I was muted there. Um, yeah, I think uh, what uh, Councilwoman Stewart just said is uh, is an important piece. Uh, well, what everyone has said, um, what, what we where we want to get is uh, a situation where um, most people can use the park uh, for all people. Actually, where we want to get is where all people can use the park uh, in the way that that um, benefits them the most. Uh, but I think Councilwoman George is exactly right. The people, the constituents that we hear from. Um, uh, in all of our districts, uh, you know, it's it's and goes by how you how you use the park is how you see is the the best way to to use the park is the the way that you use it. Um, and I, and that's not that's not anything about this particular issue. That's the same way with budget when we make budget decisions. You know, the people, how do you uh, 
um, decide what is, you know, in people's minds, what do they decide is an important uh, role of government? Generally, it's a role that you use uh, is an important role and one that you do, that you don't use is more of an unimportant role. So that's just kind of the nature of, uh, of our work. Um, so I think it is incumbent upon us to try to find uh, a solution that will address everyone's needs um, including that need for safety. So, um, you know, I, I too um, would like to see us have a, a situation that is um, the most accessible for people and also while at the same time uh, being the, the safest uh, for folks as well. And I think I think we can do that. I think we can come up with something that is both um, uh, meets both of those goals. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. And uh, let's go to Councilwoman Fowler, if you've got any comments. Yeah, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so the people that I have talked to in my district and out of my district, um, you know, have varied uses uh, within the park. And so I think we just need to be open-minded that um, not everyone has the same um, use and uh, people that just want to take a Sunday drive through the park uh, because they're unable or you know whether it be a hot summer day and you know COPD keeps them from um, being able to walk um, I just think that we we have to make sure that everybody is um, accommodated and um, I, I think we can do that. I'm like, Rick, I think we can do that. We can figure this out. And, um, you know, I, I have to think about what, um, you know, the Homestead wanted when, um, you know, he, he envisioned in that park. And I think we need to keep that in mind as well. So thank you. Thank you so much, Councilman Fowler. And thank all of you council folks one for being here and taking part in this because um, I know it's important to all of you so thanks again I'll now turn it over to Margaret who will uh, start reading some of the chat questions as well as go over the ground rules for the rest of the meeting and talk about you know what'll what'll happen when we run out of time um, so I'll, I'll turn it back over to Miss Margaret thanks Dana I really appreciate it and thanks everybody again for joining we have quite a few people uh, who are joining us via Facebook live and a number of questions and comments are coming in so um, if you have a question or, or a comment, feel free to put it in the chat and we will get to as many as we can. Um, we'll be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, if we do not get to your question or your comment, just please note that your comments are taken into consideration. And if you do have a question, we'll respond to your question um, on that same stream if we're not able to respond to it um, on this uh, live portion that we're doing right now. Um, in, the, in the instance of time, uh, we're gonna predominantly focus on the Iroquois Loop Road um, and the conversation that we're having right now. If there is a question that we're able to answer quickly, um, like the first one that, that popped up, we'll try to do that, but uh, we're really gonna focus as much as we can on the loop and the loop road. So um, the one question from um, Nancy Bohannon, will the amphitheater open back up and will it continue to be open for the foreseeable future? The plan is for the amphitheater to be open for the foreseeable future. It's certainly a gem in our park system. Um, we do plan to open mid-May for some, for some gra graduations. Uh, we are currently still under capacity and other COVID guidelines. Um, so we don't have any, you know, major sold out uh, shows that, that are planned, but um, we are optimistic with vaccinations and everything that uh, we will move to that. But mid-May, uh, we will sm start to have some smaller capacity restricted events at the amphitheater. So we're all very, very excited about that. Um, next question comes from Katie Meyer. I would love to see the entire lower loop road open to one way vehicle traffic. I hope to see the upper loop open as well. Investing in resolving the erosion issues would greatly increase the value of the park. Uh, we all agree with that. So thank you so much, Katie, for, for that comment. Paige Packer, um, can you explain why the survey had different questions than the Cherokee survey? Uh, so Paige, uh, quickly to respond to that, um, council members and citizens, and based on um, the, the calls and the emails and the questions that we were getting from people, um, regarding both parks um, determined the questions for the survey. So the majority of the questions uh, were consistent. 
Um, the Iroquois loop questions were a little bit more specific. Um, and again, that was based on feedback that we received from council members, Olmstead, our parks department, and just the, the input that we were getting um, from the survey questions and from all of you that were calling. Um, James Lecker, why put traffic barriers up last year if the park was going to be closed to vehicles? There's plenty of room for both pedestrians and vehicles. It's never been a problem before. Um, Dana, Jeff, any, or Layla, any responses to that? Well, originally, you know, uh, it was put up, the, the barriers were put up due to COVID, um, and that's why they went up. Um, and I think, you know, we're always concerned with park safety, as I think we've heard echoed by every council member here tonight, as well as, you know, it's very important to us. Uh, but that's the reason the barriers were put up was due to COVID restrictions. I'll also Thanks. add, they may be speaking of those stick bollards that are in the road, um, separating the pedestrian lane from the vehicular lane. And that was done, you know, well before the closure, so. Great, thank you both. Next question comes from Jake Allgaier. Could the roads be partially reopened, specifically the western side connecting the golf course to the horse barn in the south? The eastern o road could remain closed for pedestrians. So again, um, Jake, thanks for, for that comment. We will put that on the queue as we're talking about the different options. So we appreciate that. Suggestions, thoughts, ideas, all of those, please keep those coming. Um, Ashley Pateska, if when the park reopens to vehicle traffic, can there be a physical barrier to protect pedestrian traffic, especially young users? Dana, you want to take that one? Sure, and I think that is one of the things that we talk about with safety. Uh, there's certainly areas, specific areas in the parks and the roadways where it may be difficult for vehicles to see pedestrians. So I think when Layla commented um, about, about some of those types of small barriers that could be put between the pedestrians and vehicles. I don't see, you know, a, a significant thing like a, like a guide rail or anything. I think that would be a little bit obtrusive, uh, but there certainly are traffic common devices that can be considered. And, and some of those kind of bollard like items uh, are certainly one of those. And, and Dirk, you feel free to jump into as a, a traffic expert or Jeff. We, we typically use the, uh, the posts and paint to separate. We find that they're decent uses on, on public streets. Um, uh, and I think, you know, I, I think there's places in the, in the parks that would be a good way to delineate spaces for pedestrians and spaces for cyclists. The, the, the post, the post that we added in the, in the park, um, that was specifically because we had drivers that were cheating into the bike and pedestrian part of the roadway so they could go around those curves much faster. So that was a traffic calming measure. Um, and I think it's been quite effective. So I, I think we want to put it in strategic locations to control the separation that's desired and keep people safe. Great, thank you all for those responses. The next question comes from Dana Lindgren Sikora. As a person with a disability, I'm concerned with accessibility. How will this be ADA compliant if parts are closed to vehicular traffic? So, Dirk, Jeff, any one of you want to take that? I know that um, as far as the amenities and accessibility to the amenities, that's certainly um, higher in our priority list to, to make sure that we're looking into, but anybody else have specific responses to that question? Well, the, the parking is available off of Newcut Road there at the, at the amphitheater. And uh, so, so I think it is, it is uh, really ADA compliant that you can get, you can get to the park, you can park, you can get out and, and you're, you have accessibility. Um, I'm not certain of the parts that we've got closed, what is meant by ADA concerns, because I, I don't know that the whole lot of spots that you get out and, and, and start really moving around in a wheelchair. So I, I'm not, I'm not sure that I actually understand the question as much so much. All right. 
Any other thoughts? Well, well if, if, if I may, I, as that is some of the, the questions that I've had is there are those are citizens who cannot walk and they enjoy the, the scenic surrounding an Iroquois park via an automobile. And that might be what the what the caller is asking about uh, accessing not just where will you access the park where you go into the park and park your vehicle is is enjoying that loop in a vehicle is what I took from that question. And, uh, and I know that it's a concern of, of some of the folks that I've heard heard from. And, and I'll jump in, Margaret and say, yeah, that truly is a concern. Um, you know, compliance and safety are two of the biggest things we look in our park. When we, we do our budgets, we always do, do those items first. Um, so that is definitely under consideration for how we move forward. All right, another great comment that came in from Michelle Morris. I don't know if the Parks Department has the budget for this, but it would be great if there could be a tram or shuttle that could take people to the Overlook. So definitely a, a good thought. It's you are you are expressing that opinion to the right people as as you have quite a few Metro Council members on here and you have our wonderful partners at Olmstead um, that help us add so many amazing amenities that uh, we may not necessarily be able to do within the realms of the of the city budget. So thanks, Michelle, for that. Um, Sibby Bullock, any consideration given to opening the roads for vehicle access certain days of the week and pedestrian cyclists for others? Dana, Layla? Layla, you jump in. Yeah, I think that's one of those options that, that we can look at. Um, how do we make accessible for all and how do we keep safely? Um, but Layla, I know you've had a tremendous amount of thought on this as well. Yeah, I mean, I think um, some sort of split where it's open a few days a week and closed a couple days a week is certainly an option that can be explored along with a one way loop or speed humps, you know, other traffic calming devices. I think this is sort of an effort to hear some of those suggestions. There are so many ideas on the table. Um, again, because there hasn't been a lot of consistent, there hasn't been an overwhelming uh, message that we've heard, I will say. It's just been a lot of very different viewpoints. And um, my thinking on that, you know, they used to have the road, uphill road open Wednesdays and on weekends. Sometimes it became an issue of staffing from the parks department, the ability to get in there and open and close the gates at the right amount of time. So that would be um, just something that I would think about and consider. Right, and it's important also for people to understand the logistics of that, Layla, you're right, the, the people power that it takes um, to do things like that. Um, next question that comes in, what about access to emergency vehicles if the park loop roads are closed? Great question. That was the first question um, that we asked when we were considering this for uh, for COVID. And even um, when, um, you know, Cherokee Loop was closed one day a month pre-COVID, um, the first call we made was to our EMS emergency folks to make sure that they would be able to access it, that everybody knew what was going on. Um, and that we were all able to to work together. And if you all remember, um, LMPD was great partners with us when when this first started, um, and they were at both park locations, um, just talking to people, answering questions, and then also just being there in general. So we really appreciate their continued support through through all of this. Um, John, um, um, uh. Basically, is um, just overall. This is from our community engagement team member John, who's monitoring this. So we want to thank John and Morgan for all their help tonight. Uh, but he said that there's a lot of questions coming in about speed humps and perhaps lowering the speed on the road. Um, so um, we could talk about that as a calming measure. Uh, Dirk, you you talked about the the the, the post. So do you just want to kind of give kind of overall thoughts on on speed humps, speed bumps in in these type of situations? You know, I, I, I'm not certain that this would be a good location for speed humps. You, you want to you want to space them about every 400 to 500 feet. Um, but the thing is, with the with the terrain in Iroquois Park, um, the runoff of the roadway when you put a speed hump across there, then that starts directing water to those ditches right there where the speed hump is, and you start creating some erosion problems. It would really probably result in a lot of a, a lot of maintenance issues. I, I, I'm not sure that's the way to do it. Um, 
we, we might be able to uh, think of other ways to, you know, neck down or put some kind of a, a chicane, some kind of diversions that make you pay attention and slow you down a little bit. I think there's some other solutions that would slow people down. Um, putting signs up, um, uh, that's the that's the first thing people would ignore is uh, the slower speed sign. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know that's uh, that's a very effective philosophy either. Uh, there, there, there's ways that we could do it. Um, I, you know, and, and I, I hear a lot of discussion about one weighing around the loop, but then you've got two lanes, and then if you only, if you reduce it to one lane, and then you've got a really wide lane, um, how you make that separation, and, and I'm afraid that would just result in higher speeds as well versus two-way traffic. At least with two-way traffic, you, you have some friction and, and it keeps people going a bit slower. So there's there's some engineered solutions out there that we could we could do that would would slow down people. I I think I think the best thing we can do is everybody that uses the park just go the speed limit and respect everybody that's out there and let's all get along. Good suggestion. We'll keep our we always say the I liked your sign comment too there, Dirk. We always say signs keep honest people honest, right? But uh, but otherwise. Uh, sometimes people ignore those signs. Elizabeth Longston, if the park remains closed, can concrete barriers be installed to prohibit vehicles from going around the current barriers? You're correct. We've had some issues with people going around the current barriers. Uh, depending upon the decision that's made, yeah, there would definitely need to be some more permanent um, items placed um, in certain locations. But then again, back to the previous question that we just had, um, more permanent structures if if that's the road that we that we go down, but also um, still allowing emergency personnel and our park staff to be able to easily access those areas if they need to. And a shout out again, um, thanks uh, Councilwoman George, but a shout out to our awesome parks team um, that work hard every day to get after things. Um, Jason Lucker, why were there no concerns or issues to vehicles using the park during Joel's or the Christmas light display before? They've gone as far as closing off a section of the road to pedestrians, as well as the southern section of the loop. Dana? Sure, Marvin. Um, yeah, so they had those events, um, both, you know, the Jack O' Lantern and the Winterwood Spectacular were both vehicle driven this year. Um, the big distinction is during the daytime, the, the roads were open up to pedestrians and bicyclists, and only when they had it fully staffed at night uh, was it open for the vehicles to come through. Uh, so that that was really the difference um, uh, as the two things. And again, they had to provide full staffing uh, for that event to make sure there was no conflict at, at night between pedestrians, bicyclists, um, and the vehicles that came through in the evening. But But again, it was open during the day for pedestrians. Thanks, Dana. Next one comes from Allie Vincent. This is just a, a, a comment for us to, to take into consideration. Uh, she says, as an, a runner and race director in the Louisville area, speed humps are a concern. Runners will talk negatively about a course with speed humps, and it could very well be a deterrent for races. And we do know that Iroquois Park is certainly a home for many 5Ks and other races. So, Allie, thank you so much for that comment. Um, Beth Preslar, what can we do about people getting out and moving the barriers? Great question. If anyone has any awesome solutions for the temporary barriers, um, please let us know. We we know that people are moving uh, those barriers, but uh, anybody want to? I, I, I would like to just comment, and I wanted to, like two questions ago, we were talking about the more permanent barriers. If we do decide uh, to, to keep the loop closed to vehicular traffic, we, we, we must shore up the barriers as they are, because people will get around them. And I don't want to, to create a false sense of security for those who are walking and biking on that road. If we choose to close it, we, we would have to shore up the, the barriers. Because uh, just the other day when I was walking, there were some four wheelers and some people, they can skirt motorcycles. I've not seen any vehicles, but they'll try. Uh, you you guys know that they will try. So I, if we do close it, we must provide a a completely safe, uh, secure walking area for them on that road. Great, thanks, Councilmember Triplett. Um, Doris Young Sims, a rock star from Louisville Tourism. Glad you're joining us tonight. 
uh, can we open the full perimeter of the park and make it one way? Uh, so again, thanks for that. Certainly we'll take that into consideration. Um, ben Cronios, what about slightly widening the scenic loop and building a raised median between the pike, or sorry, um, between the bike, ped, and car lanes? Uh, so again, thank you, Ben, for that suggestion. Um, Nancy, again, she had our first question. She's back. Um, we weren't considering this a problem before COVID. Now we want to close a park to traffic. Um, Nancy, that's that's not necessarily the case. As we said at the top, I'm not sure if you were able to join us. Um, we, we closed it during COVID um, to provide more space for people to social distance when it was one of the few options to get out and enjoy um, our parks. And then in that time, in the year that it's been closed, we have heard from so many people. We got calls all over the place, as did the council members in Olmstead. So we just really wanted to open it up and hear what other people were thinking, just to make sure that we have a good snapshot um, of what people feel about um, about the loop. We were getting a lot of calls from people wanting it to to stay closed to vehicles, other people wanting it to reopen, wondering when it would. So again, this is just an opportunity for for us to hear from as many people as we as we possibly can. So. Again, Nancy, thank you and everybody who's on the call today. Um, Sue Garrity, when we drive through the park, if there's a group of walkers, they walk side by side and take up any lane they wanted. How is this different? Duly noted, um, you are correct. Um, I know a lot of us on the call, um, almost everybody frequent uh, Iroquois Park quite a bit and we use it. So we have seen everything that you all are talking about, people moving the barricades, um, taking up lanes of road, traffic going fast, all of those things. So again, thanks for that. Um, then we have uh, another question from Lane Smith. Um, wasn't there a section of the road closed before COVID? And yes, there was. Layla, if you want to jump in and answer that, that'd be great. Sure, it was a section um, entering at Sanders Gate. It was There was a gate on the right that closed it all the way to the amphitheater. Um, and I'm sure that the slides, yes, here we go right here. So the red section there on the lower portion of the map is what was closed before the pandemic. Great, thanks Layla and thanks Morgan and John for getting that up so quickly. Lori Edwards, the pedestrian lane is not wide enough in Iroquois Park, especially for how busy the park is on the weekend. It's amazing how clean the loop is without vehicle traffic. That was one of the uh, survey questions as well. Um, and we did, we did get some responses back to that. So Lori, again, thanks for, for um, your response. All right, we'll give it just a, a minute or so to see if there are any other questions. In the meantime, while we see if any questions um, pop up, we'll, we'll open it up to council members. If there's anyone who has any uh, closing or final remarks, again, um, feel free to share this, this link um, to this evening's conversation. Um, again, people can continue to post comments on this thread. Um, they also, you also can encourage your your, your friends, coworkers, um, users of the park to email us at parks at louisvilleky.gov or any of the council members on the call. Um, and again, we'll continue to take all of these um, thoughts and opinions into consideration as we move forward. So, uh, Le or Dana, I'll toss it back to you and see if anybody has any closing comments. Again, minor, just thank you, everybody. What, what a great interaction, great questions. This is exactly why we wanted to have this meeting, right? So we could all hear from folks. And it seems like we're all sharing a lot of the same concerns and, and everybody has the same feeling about the park. And, and I know we'll sort out what is gonna be the best thing moving forward. So I will now kind of open up to council members. Uh, if you do have any closing remarks, please go right ahead. I, I'll go. <laughs> Just, just quickly, uh, thank you again, everyone. Uh, great discussion, wonderful issues that we that we need to to get our arms around so we can get this right. Um, I, again, just for me, uh, representing the people that I've heard from the most, the majority of the calls and emails that I've gotten, uh, it it they clearly want the road opened as it was pre-COVID. And uh, that would be my vote. Also, with regards to the walking lanes, um, those are very generous walking lanes. What are those, four or five feet wide? 
And and look, I, I I've enjoyed the walks too while while it's been closed, but I've noticed the walkers will not walk on the shoulder of the road. They walk on the white line. And yes, if there was a vehicle coming, that would probably be a problem. But I, I would have to take issue about uh, widening the, the walking paths. Those are very generous. And we may have to uh, perhaps attempt a re-education. And uh, talking about signs, uh, just to re-educate the, the walkers and the pedestrians, stay in the lane. Stay in the lane. Stay close to the side. You don't have to use all four feet of that lane stay on the side of the road. So um, I think those walking lanes are very generous. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Certainly welcome any other council comments or closings. Thank you, Director. I, I think just what I took from this conversation is really that um, we essentially have four uh, options in the way of next steps. If I heard correctly, there's a group of folks who want the road to reopen as it was prior to COVID. There's a group of folks who want to keep the road closed it has, as it has been since COVID. There's a group of folks who want to look at road adaptations for traffic calming measures. We heard things like everything from signs and speed humps and uh, barricades and, and those sort of enhancements. And then we heard uh, perhaps complete and Dirk, forgive me, I'm, I'm probably saying this wrong, but road adaptations around like creation of a one way. Um, and, and maybe, maybe as I say that they're actually five, because the other one is something that was just briefly touched on. And that is the idea of having the road open certain days of the week to allow for that accessibility through an enjoyment of the park and a vehicle. And so what I'm wondering if is as a next step, if parks would be in a position to kind of you know, scope out some of those options for us to see pros and cons, including costs, because, you know, while no one wants to talk about it, uh, we certainly know that, that that will guide some of the next steps as well. So I guess I'm, I'm looking at, at um, Director Kessler and, and Margaret, I don't know if possible, but could we potentially see some pros and cons of the solutions that have been given today? Yeah, absolutely, Councilman. I think that that's a great way to put it. That's exactly what I feel our next steps are as well, um, is to scope out any costs and, and scope out any pro, pros and cons within the, the four or five different scenarios. Uh, we definitely can do that. I'd like to jump in here real quick. Um, <clears throat> I know that this is, um, you know, just kind of weighing heavy on everyone's shoulders, um, but to be able to answer um, effectively and um, you know, to, my, to my constituents, I'd like to um, you know, make sure that we do this in a timely fashion. I think that it's important. I mean, spring is here and, and people want to use the park and I hope that we can move forward um, quickly in making this decision. And I'm with um, Councilman Triplett. I mean, I said that in the beginning, but I do believe that um, you know, the vast majority of my constituents that have reached out to our office um, wish for the park to uh, the, the loop to reopen as it was pre COVID. So, and, uh, and if anyone's watching and they're in district 25 and you have additional comments, please, you know, email or, or call my office. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman. Um, Councilman Fowler. I see you're still on there. Did you have any additional closing comments? I do. Um, you know, I, I really don't want to use COVID as a reason to close air uh, the loop. Uh, I, I just think, I mean, it was necessary to do it for the, the last uh, year. Um, and, and I see the value in that, but I just don't want to use it as an excuse um, not to open that loop back up. I just really think it's important that, um, you know, all segments of society um, and ability, um, you know, like I said, some people it's mobility, some people it may be asthma or whatever, but just to be able to drive through that uh, park, I think is very valuable for a lot of people. And um, I, I just don't think that we should put one person or not one person, but one segment of users above um, other segments of users. I think we just have to go back to the way it was. That's all. Thank you. 
Well, thank you. And I would be remiss if I didn't also turn to my partner at Olmstead and see if Layla has any closing comments as well, Layla. I just want to again reiterate that this has been a really productive conversation from our standpoint. Um, we got a lot of good feedback and good ideas from the public and this is just a situation where there was not an easy answer. So this was helpful to get all of this input and we really appreciate it. Um, I think that there's a lot of people who really enjoy it with no cars and I think there's plenty of people who miss it um, because they really experience the park from a car. So I can see both uh, sides of the issue and uh, I'm confident we can come up with a good solution to please everyone. So thank you. Thank you, Layla. Again, thank you all your council members for participating. Uh, as we've all stated, great to hear from these people. Uh, we can gather all this information in a kind of a packet and put it all together with all the comments we've heard tonight, as well as the survey. Um, we can assess what costs may be associated and the pros and cons as we talked about uh, with, with the different scenarios and hopefully get at back to everybody in a very timely manner because yeah, we, we, however we decide this, we want our park to be in full use uh, for as many folks as we can. Um, with that as Margaret, is there anything else we need to close out on? All I don't right. think so. Great. Well, hey, thanks again, everybody. Appreciate you. Uh, appreciate everybody out there giving us comments.